There has always been a need to transfer information. The main objective of a data communication system is to transfer information from one place to another. Modern data communications technology can trace its heritage back to the 1800s with the development of the telegraph. Data communications technologies, strategies, and equipment continue to develop for an ever-expanding list of applications, from the common telephone to space exploration. For many years, utilities both in North America and abroad have wanted to standardize on a suite of communication protocols that would meet the communication requirements of the electrical utility industry. In the early 1990s, electrical power utilities started to work extensively on this issue. The resulting communications protocol standard is known as IEC 61850. After a brief introduction to the IEC 61850 protocol standard, we'll focus our attention on the IEC 61850 station bus portion of the protocol. This will include the station bus's physical layer, both twisted pair and fiber optic full duplex Ethernet, the GSSE and GOOSE high speed peer to peer communication services, the standardized information models the information exchange methods, and finally, the client-server services. The course will also touch on the substation configuration language, the IEC 61850 process bus, and compliance testing. These sections will include lab exercises to assist in better understanding GE Multilens Universal Relay and EnerVista Viewpoint Monitoring's implementation of the IEC 61850 protocol. The IEC 61850 specification is composed of 10 parts. Students interested in learning more about each part and additional protocols that are outside the focus of this course are encouraged to visit the listed websites. To better understand the IEC 61850 protocol, we should start by developing a reference model of the utility communication architecture. From a protective relaying perspective, a typical substation consists of the following parts. Switchgear and the associated CTs and PTs. Protective relays, which are now more commonly referred to as Intelligent Electronic Devices, or IEDs, due to their enhanced functionality such as programmable logic, communications, waveform capture, and event logging. The local graphical human-machine interfaces, substation controller, and or data concentrators are options that may or may not be present within the substation. The control center and the communication links between the devices completes the model. Now let's take a closer look at the communications. The communications links vary greatly, but fall into three major categories. Communication between devices within the substation, communications between devices within the substation and the central control center, and communications between clients at the control center. The IEC 61850 protocol standard divides the communication infrastructure into three areas, the substation to the control center, the station bus, and the process bus. From 1994 forward in North America, the EPRI and the IEEE started the task of defining a station bus. This new phase was called UCA 2.0. During 1996 in Europe, Technical Committee 57 began work on IEC 61850 with a focus similar to UCA 2.0. The UCA 2.0 substation bus peer-to-peer -peer messaging service called Goose was specified. Several manufacturers, including GE Multilin, implemented the service and verified interoperability. In 1997, the UCA Committee and Technical Committee 57 agreed to work together to define a common international standard, which resulted in the current IEC 61850 specification. Within this new specification, the UCA 2.0 Goose was renamed Generic Substation State Event, or GSSE, and an enhanced Goose was specified. The IEC 61850 peer-to-peer -peer service is the UCA 2.0 Goose with enhanced functionality. The IEC 61850 station bus also specifies a client-server model, which we'll look at later in the course. IEC 61850 also supports what is termed as self-description. This refers to the ability of a device to be browsed to determine what data is contained within it. The concept works as follows. Each physical device, such as a relay, may contain one or more logical devices. Each logical device may contain one or more logical nodes, such as a circuit breaker or transformer. Each logical node contains a predefined set of data classes which contain data. The logical node data can be browsed, similar to using a finder or explorer to search computer files. 
The standardization of these files and data contained within the relays drastically reduces the integration time and cost for HMI and SCADA applications. The ramifications of this key feature will become apparent later in the course. Integrators and those that configure a large number of IEDs were looking for a common set of configuration tools that would work with IEDs manufactured by different vendors. In response to this need, IEC 61850 has defined a substation configuration language that will accept XML files from each vendor's product containing the product's configuration information known as the ICD. The substation configuration software can extract the ICD portions of the XML file from each device within the system and allow the user to create an overall system configuration. The configuration files for each device, called the CID file, can be extracted and then loaded back into the respective XML file for transfer back into each relay. IEC 61850 has also defined a process bus. The long-term objective of this bus is the elimination of the hardwired I.O. used to monitor CTs and PTs, in addition to transporting the control and status information of circuit breakers and switches. Now that we have an overview of IEC 61850, we'll focus our attention on the following aspects of the substation bus which are pertinent to protective relaying. The physical layer or media of the bus, the high-speed peer-to-peer communication service, the client service services, and the substation configuration language. Faced with the proliferation of closed network systems, in 1978, the International Standards Organization defined a reference model for communication between open systems, which is called the Open System Interconnection Model. This model is composed of seven layers. Each layer has a defined purpose and interfaces with the layer above and below it. Let's take a look at the role of each layer. The physical layer includes elements involved with the actual transmission and reception of signals such as physical connections between the device and the network, network topology, electrical aspects of signaling voltages and currents, for example, which voltage levels are considered a logic 1 and logic 0, in addition to how much current the transmitter must be capable of supplying. Signal modulation technique, for example, is it a simple on-off technique or FM or AM, etc. Mechanical aspects such as the connectors and physical medium to be used. In utility and industrial power system applications, the most commonly used physical layer standards are RS-232, RS-423, RS-485, 10100 base T, and 10100 base F Ethernet. We will learn about these standards in depth in the following sections of this course. The data link layer provides the services that allow communication between devices. This includes framing or separation of messages, error detection and correction mechanism, and an addressing mechanism. While the data link is concerned with a direct exchange of frames among devices on a single communications channel, the network layer is responsible for device-to-device -device data delivery and optimal routing across multiple data links. These underlying layers might result in packets that are delivered out of sequence, missing, corrupted, or delayed due to lower layer communication issues. To address this, the transport layer provides a guaranteed delivery messaging service that ensures the data is error-free and correctly sequenced, allowing process-to-process -process communications between devices across a network or multiple networks. The session layer provides a mechanism for the establishment of a communication session between applications running within the devices, while the presentation layer ensures the correct translation of data. The application layer provides the facilities or interface to allow the applications protocols or drivers, such as Modbus or DNP, to use the network. At this point, the roles of each layer may be unclear. As the course progresses, we'll refer back to this model with examples to help clarify things further. In the past, the most commonly used physical layer standards by utility and industrial power system applications were RS-232, RS-422, RS-485, and Ethernet. More recently, the migration has been toward Ethernet. Over the years, many Ethernet physical standards have been developed. IEC 61850 does not recommend one physical interface over any other. However, Twisted Pair has proven to be susceptible to electrical noise, and so GE Multilin recommends the use of fiber-optic Ethernet for the substation bus. 
Twisted pairs should be reserved for office areas, such as the control center, which is away from sources of large transients, which are typical of the substation environment. The term high-speed LAN is open for interpretation as to what is considered high speed. The general consensus is that this term refers to LANs with baud rates that are at least greater than what can be achieved through a serial RS-232 port found on a common desktop computer. There are many high-speed LAN technologies on the market today, with some being closed and others open. It's also generally accepted that Ethernet is the standard high-speed LAN technology at the physical through network layers. Over the past decade, there have been many advancements in Ethernet LAN hardware, resulting in high-quality, robust, and multi-vendor compatible hardware, readily available almost anywhere in the world at relatively low cost. It then follows that larger industrial and utility power applications have already migrated from older proprietary RS-232 and RS-485-based LAN technology to Ethernet, or are in the process of doing so. Over the years, several physical standards have evolved. The modern standards support full duplex Ethernet, while the older standards support only half-duplex operation. By far, the two most popular physical layer standards are 10100 Base T and 10100 Base F. Both support full duplex operation, each with its own advantages, and so it will be these two physical standards that we'll examine. The most common electrical standard today is 10100 Base T. The 10 refers to the operating baud rate of 10 megabits per second, while 100 refers to a baud rate of 100 megabits per second. Most new equipment can operate at either baud rate, and so the designation 10100 has evolved to identify this capability. The term base stands for baseband, which means that the entire bandwidth of the LAN is used to transmit one signal. The T stands for twisted pair, which means the transmitter and receiver use separate pairs of wires for a differential signal, with the wire pairs being twisted together. Let's start with the configuration of the communication cable itself. The cable consists of four pairs of wires terminated in RJ45 connectors. The maximum length of the cable is 100 meters. Only pairs 2 and 3 are required for 10 megabit operation, while all four are required for 100 megabit operation. Having said this, most twisted pair cables are assembled with all four pairs. The cable pin connections can be one of two configurations. The first is called a straight-through cable, and the second is called either a crossover or patch cable. As per standard, each of the wires within the cable has the following color code regardless of whether the cable is straight-through or crossover. For wire pair 1, one wire is white with blue bands, while the other wire is blue. For wire pair 2, one wire is white with orange bands, while the other wire is orange. For wire pair 3, one wire is white with green bands, while the other wire is green. And for wire pair 4, one wire is white with brown bands, while the other wire is brown. The straight-through cable wiring is used to connect an Ethernet device to a switch or hub. The patch or crossover cable is used to establish a point-to-point -point Ethernet LAN between two Ethernet devices. The 10100 base T topology is a star topology, where each device on the Ethernet LAN branches out from a central switch or switches that have been connected together to form the backbone of the network. The port that connects one switch to another is often called the uplink port, and with many switches, the uplink port can operate at much higher baud rates than the standard ports. The connection of several higher speed uplink ports to produce a higher speed path between switches is often referred to as a backbone. The maximum length of cable between a device and the switch is 100 meters. All components used in a 10100 base T LAN should be rated with the Category 5 Enhanced Level of Quality Assurance. Two of the major Ethernet network components are hubs and switches. You can think of either a hub or a switch as a big data manifold with connections for devices and other switches or hubs to exchange data. This means the data can flow to any device connected to the switch. Hubs and switches are microprocessor-based, and so many switches have configuration software to optimize the LAN's performance. These types of switches are called managed switches. 
Other switches have default configurations with little or no configurable features, which are called unmanaged switches. There are many advantages of a switch over a hub. Hubs just transfer information from one port to all other ports. Switches, on the other hand, can learn the location of specific devices and route messages to them, thereby reducing data traffic on the network. Switches also have the capability of buffering messages, which eliminates collisions on a full duplex Ethernet LAN. Let's take a closer look at this feature. Within a full duplex Ethernet LAN, all components can support simultaneous transmission and reception of data. For example, if the green and blue Ethernet devices transmit a message onto the Ethernet network at the same time, one of the messages will be buffered at the switch, and the other message will be passed through to the other ports. Once the blue message has been transmitted, the switch will send the green message automatically. Given that the maximum size of an Ethernet data packet is 1.5 kilobytes, even at a transmission rate of 10 megabits per second, the delay is negligible. If the switch were replaced with a hub, both messages would collide at all ports. This is normal for a half-duplex Ethernet LAN, and in such a case, both messages would eventually get through all ports using a collision detection mechanism, which is built into the Ethernet layers, but there would be additional delays. In recent years, the filtering and buffering advantages of switches have increased their demand, reducing manufacturing costs to be comparable to that of hubs, and as a result, many vendors are no longer offering hubs. The following 10100 Base-T lab has been divided into two parts. The first will demonstrate how to interconnect a 10 Base-T Ethernet LAN and an RS-485 LAN. We will be using the GE Multilin Multinet to allow masters on the Ethernet LAN to communicate to SR relays on the RS-485 LAN. In the second part, we will demonstrate how to integrate the universal relay into the Ethernet LAN. The equipment required for this lab will include a computer with Windows 2000, NT, or XP, and a 10100 Base T Ethernet adapter. We will also need at least one GE Multilin SR relay, a Multinet unit and a Multilink switch, and Category 5 enhanced T100 Base T straight through Ethernet cables. The GE Multilin RS485 ports support a protocol called Modbus, which we will discuss in detail later in the course. At this time, it is sufficient to say that the Modbus protocol is like a language and operates on a master and slave basis. Within the implementation of Modbus, there is only one master on the network and at least one or more devices acting as slaves. The master initiates all communications. The GE Multilin Multinet Serial to Ethernet Converter is a communications module that interfaces an RS-485 Modbus LAN to an Ethernet LAN. This allows multiple Modbus masters on the Ethernet LAN to communicate to the slaves on the RS-485 Modbus LAN. The Multinet does this by buffering the commands sent by the masters and then acting as the master on the RS-485 LAN by repeating these commands to the slaves on the RS-485 LAN. Once the slaves respond, the Multinet master sends the response back to the appropriate master on the Ethernet LAN. The Multinet acts as a server on the Ethernet LAN and a master on the RS-485 LAN. We will assume that the RS-485 LAN has been wired to the slaves correctly, and each relay has been assigned a unique Modbus slave address in addition to matching baud rates and parity. We will focus on the configuration of the computer and the Multinet. Let's start with the computer. The first step is to configure the computer's IP and subnet mask addresses. Without these addresses, a device cannot communicate over an Ethernet LAN. Within an office LAN, this configuration is normally performed automatically by other computers on the network called servers, which are running special software. Relying on a server to perform this function within a protective relaying LAN isn't desirable, as a failure of the server could result in failure of the entire Ethernet LAN. A provision is made within the computer to configure permanent, or what is termed static IP and subnet mask addresses, such that a server isn't required. Let's see how this configuration is performed. First, we need to obtain the IP, subnet mask, and possibly gateway addresses from the LAN administrator. There are rules associated with the assignment of these numbers which go well beyond the scope of this course. For all intents and purposes, this is just a method of identifying the specific devices on the network, which has no bearing on the protection and or FlexLogic performance. For a test network which will allow 253 devices, 
You can select a network mask of 255.255.255.0 for all computers and relays. The IP address must, however, be unique. For the test network, IP addresses ranging from 3.94.244.1 through to 3.94.244.253 can be used. Once the computer has booted, right-click on the icon labeled My Network Places, followed by the property selection. Right-mouse-click on the Local Area Connections icon and select Properties. Locate and click on the Ethernet card. The Ethernet card is typically referred to as an Ethernet adapter. Select Use the following IP address and then enter a unique IP address. We will enter an IP within the range of our test network addresses. Next, enter the subnet mask. We will enter our test network address. Next, select OK and then OK again to exit the Local Area Network Properties menu. This should return you to the main Windows screen. Select Run, then enter CMD to start the DOS shell. At the DOS prompt, enter the command ipconfig space slash renew, followed by the Enter key. This is the command that will cause the Ethernet adapter to immediately use the Ethernet IP and subnet mask addresses we just programmed. An on-screen report will appear indicating which addresses are now being used by the adapter. Next, we will configure the multinet to act as a communication bridge between the RS-485 LAN and the Ethernet LAN. The multinet can be directly connected to a computer using a crossover cable or via a switch using standard 10100 base T cable, which would allow additional computers or devices to communicate with the RS-485 network and each other. With either configuration, once the cable has been connected at both ends, a small LED called the link light should illuminate within a couple of minutes. This LED is typically located at the port. If the LED fails to illuminate, something is wrong. Usually a faulty cable is the cause. Check the connector and or replace the cable and try again. Remember that it may take a couple of minutes after the connection for the link LED to come on. Once successfully connected, the Multinet server can be configured through Ethernet using its media access control address. This MAC address is unique in the world to this device and was assigned during manufacturing and cannot be changed. The MAC address is located on a label attached to the back of the Multinet. To configure the Multinet, launch its setup software, which can be found on the GE Multilin product CD or website. Enter the MAC address found on the Multinet label in addition to a unique IP address. We will enter an IP within the range of our test network addresses. Next, enter the subnet mask. Here we will enter our test network address. The gateway address would only be added if one existed. Next, enter the baud rate and parity setting of the RS-485 network, and then click on the Save button to save the settings to the multinet. If the settings were saved successfully, a message to that effect will appear. Once the settings have been saved to the multinet, click the Ping button to test the multinet's communication to the computer. A reply from the multinet confirms that the communications are working properly. The last step is to confirm communications to each SR relay. Launch the appropriate SR software and go to the Device Setup menu. Select Add Site and then select Add Device. Set the interface to Ethernet. Enter the IP address of the multinet and the slave address of the SR relay. The order code and firmware version can be read from the relay itself to fill in the last two fields. Press the Read Order Code button the appearance of the order code and firmware version verifies that the Ethernet communication link is working correctly. If not, check the RS-485 cabling, terminations, SR relay baud rate and parity, and once the problem is resolved, read the order code again to verify correct operation. Select OK to save the settings and exit the device setup menu. The SR relay can now be programmed or monitored via the Ethernet LAN. Note that if a second computer is connected to the Ethernet LAN, both computers can monitor or program the relay at the same time. Through the Ethernet LAN, the Multinet takes the requests from both computers which are Modbus masters and then issues the commands onto the RS-485 LAN. 
The responses from the slaves on the RS-45 LAN are then passed on to the Ethernet LAN via the Multinet. Now we will add a universal relay onto our Ethernet LAN. The physical configurations of the communication ports for the universal relay vary between the older version 3 CPU hardware and the more recent version 4 CPU. However, the functionality remains for the most part the same. Regardless of the version, the port located on the front of the relay is an RS-232 port with a default configuration that supports the point-to-point -point Modbus protocol or can be configured to support DNP. This port cannot be networked when point-to-point -point Modbus is being supported. In addition to the front port, both versions 3 and 4 offer three different communication configurations, the first configuration being two RS-485 ports located on the rear of the CPU that can be configured to support Modbus RTU or the DNP protocol. The second configuration is a single 10-base T or F Ethernet port in addition to an RS-485 port. The Ethernet port supports UCA 2.0 and Modbus over TCP IP. The third configuration is a redundant 10 base F Ethernet port. For this configuration, the relay typically uses the normal port for communication and will automatically switch to the alternate port if the relay detects a problem with the normal port. Once the normal port is healthy again, it will automatically switch back. Now we'll configure the UR. Using the keypad, enter a unique IP address and subnet mask. Again, if using our test network addresses, the unique IP address will be in the range of 3.94.244.001 through 3.94.244.254, and the subnet mask will be 255.255.255.0. Set the Modbus address and configure the Ethernet port for full duplex. Connect the UR to the switch via a 10 base T cable and ensure that all appropriate sync lights are lit. To test the network, perform the ping test as follows. Start the DOS shell on the computer by selecting Run, then typing CMD followed by the Enter key. Type the command Ping followed by the appropriate IP address number for a specific UR. You should receive a response indicating successful communication. Next, unplug each individual UR and ping that UR's address again, and you should get a timeout response indicating that no other device on the LAN has this IP address. If you get a response other than a timeout, this means there is another device on the network with the same IP address. Since no two Ethernet devices on the same LAN can have the same IP address, you will need to correct this situation. Connect the cable and perform the ping test again to verify the UR is again communicating on the Ethernet LAN. Launch the EnterVista UR configuration software and select Device Setup. Enter the UR's IP and slave address and select Read Order Code. The appearance of the order code and firmware version verifies that the Ethernet communication link is working correctly. This concludes the 10100 Base T Lab. In power system applications where longer distances are involved, Fiber optic Ethernet is preferred over the more popular 10100 base T LAN medium due to its immunity to EMI. The higher cost and difficulty of terminating fiber cables allows twisted pair to continue to be used where appropriate. Ethernet fiber optic LANs were first referred to as fiber optic inter-repeater links. The name was later changed to 10 base FL, FP, or FB, and then finally 10 base F. The original specifications for fiber optic Ethernet were based on the technology of the mid-80s calling for the use of multi-mode fiber with fairly limited distances of 2 kilometers or less. The need for full duplex communication over greater distances at greater speeds sparked research and development. The resulting improvements in the fiber optic cable, transmitter, and receiver technology enables users to create full duplex 100 megabit Ethernet networks that are fast, reliable over long distances, and fairly inexpensive to install and maintain. Inevitably, the question arises, what is the maximum practical communication distance for fiber optic cables? The answer isn't straightforward, but must be calculated. First, we must understand that as the light travels from the transmitter to the receiver, the light's intensity is attenuated. Attenuation is measured in decibels and can be considered as the decrease of signal strength as it travels through the light path or medium. If the intensity of the light is too low, the receiver will not be able to detect the signal. 
The maximum distance is calculated in the following way. First, the power budget is determined by subtracting the transmitter's rated power from the receiver's sensitivity, both of which are measured in decibels of light intensity. For example, if a particular transmitter is rated at minus 15 decibels and the receiver's sensitivity is rated at minus 35 decibels, the difference of minus 20 decibels is the power budget. The power budget can be thought of as the maximum permitted attenuation of the light signal as it travels from the transmitter to the receiver while still permitting reliable communication. The next step is to calculate the total expected attenuation of the light by summing all sources of attenuation such as the cable, connections, splices, etc. as follows. Take the cable's rated loss per kilometer, which is in the order of minus 0.35 to minus 3 dB per kilometer depending on the cable type, times the cable length. The result is the total loss due to the cable. Next, we add the losses through the cable terminations, which is minus 1 decibel per termination point. If there are any cable splices, the attenuation per cable splice must also be added to this total. Minus 3 decibels is added to account for cable aging. And finally, an additional minus 2 decibels is added as a standard safety operating margin. It's important to note that at one point in time, some areas of Europe used non-standard 50 by 125 micrometer instead of 62.5 by 125 micrometer fiber. If sections of this cable is being used, an additional minus 3 decibels is added for each section. The sum of all these sources of attenuation is the expected total attenuation. The power budget is then compared to this total attenuation. If the power budget is greater than the total attenuation, the link will be able to provide reliable communication over the given distance. If not, the link will require modification to lower the total attenuation. Common actions to reduce the total attenuation include the use of a cable with a lower attenuation per unit distance or the installation of a fiber optic repeater to boost the signal strength. There are two types of fiber optic cable in use today, multimode and single mode fiber optic cable. Multimode fiber is constructed such that, for a given wavelength of light, the index of refraction at the surface is so high that there is total internal reflection. This can be imagined as the fiber optic cable being a tube whose interior surface is polished so smooth as to be like a mirror. Then imagine that the transmitter is like a light shining at one end of the tube. Some of the light will travel straight down the tube, while some of the light will reflect off the walls of the tube's inner mirrored surface as it travels along the tube. Single-mode fiber's construction is such that it acts as an elongated lens that is continuously focusing the light into the center of the fiber. Using these two analogies, it can be imagined that light traveling through a single-mode fiber travels through far less fiber medium, resulting in far less attenuation per unit distance, than does the light traveling through a multi-mode fiber. As a result, for a given wavelength of light, single-mode fiber typically has less attenuation per unit distance than a multi-mode fiber. The wavelengths of light that are used in fiber optic communication are 820, 1300, and 1550 nanometers because it's been found that these wavelengths of light are attenuated less than other wavelengths of light as they travel through the fiber optic medium. Traditionally, 820 nanometer cable has been offered only in multimode, but recently single mode 820 nanometer cables have come into existence. 1300 nanometer cable is offered in both single and multimode while 1,550 nanometer cable is typically only offered in single mode. Let's take a closer look at the construction of multi-mode and single mode fibers. The outer clad of both is 125 micrometers in diameter. The multi-mode core at 62.5 micrometers is a little bit thinner than the average human hair. Single mode fiber is also referred to as 9 by 125 micrometer fiber. The 9 refers to the 8 micrometer core in addition to a second outer clad which can pass a light signal. The 125 refers to the outer diameter of the fiber. There are several types of connectors that are attached to the end of the fiber cable to allow for the connection of the fiber to other devices. The ST connector is very robust and popular, and for these reasons this style of connector is used on both the GE Multilin Universal Relay and the F485 converter. Now we will switch the UR on our Ethernet LAN to a fiber communication link. It is desirable to use a fiber optic link whenever possible due to its immunity to electromagnetic interference. To convert the existing 10 base T connection between the universal relay and the switch to a fiber optic link, 
the student need only replace the 10 base T cable with an 820 nanometer multimode fiber optic cable. We will connect the fiber optic transmit port of the relay to the switch's receive port and vice versa. Remember that the maximum distance of the fiber optic cable is defined by the power budget minus the attenuation. Therefore, it is important to note that the universal relay has a 10 dB power budget. Unlike 10100 base T, the fiber optic ports do not auto-negotiate the baud rate. This is because the 10 base F ports use 820 nanometer light, while 100 base F ports use 1300 nanometer light. Due to the difference in the light frequency, 10 megabit ports cannot communicate with 100 megabit ports. We must verify that the baud rate of each fiber optic port matches before making any connections. Once the two are connected, we ensure that the link LED illuminates on the multinet. Now we have successfully switched our UR's communication link to fiber. A high-speed digital or on-off interlock signal exchange between relaying equipment had traditionally been accomplished through hardwiring the digital inputs and outputs of the relaying equipment. This method of digital information signal exchange is expensive in terms of the number of additional inputs and outputs required by the relays and installation costs. Let's take a closer look at the peer-to-peer -peer messaging service for the universal relay. The media this communication service uses is Ethernet. Whether using Goose or GSSE, the communication service works in the following way. The universal relay has an area of memory reserved for Goose or GSSE messaging called the remote outputs area. This area has been divided into two groups of 32 bits each. One group is called the DNA bit pairs, while the other is called the user bit pairs. The universal relay transmits a Goose or GSSE message containing the status of all its own remote outputs in what is called a multicast message under several conditions, beginning with the relay first powering up. Anytime an output bit changes state, another multicast message is broadcast. Subsequent multicast messages are broadcast at 4, 16, 100, and 1000 milliseconds after any output bit state change. Multicast messages are also broadcast on a user-configurable periodic basis, which can be set for once every 1 to 60 seconds. A protective relay interested in remote output information from another relay will extract the appropriate remote output status information and store the status in its remote input memory area. The universal relays can store the status of up to 32 remote outputs from up to 16 different relays within local remote input status tables. This method of data exchange has sometimes been referred to as publisher-subscriber. The typical time taken for the encoding, transmission, reception, and decoding of a GSSE or Goose message between universal relays is typically in the quarter cycle time frame, or approximately 4 milliseconds. The objective of this lab is to familiarize the student with the procedure for configuring universal relays to transmit and receive IEC 61850 GSSE messages. We assume the student has a good understanding of the universal relay and its menu structure, as is covered in both the UR Apps 1 Interactive Learning CD and the Universal Relay Platform course. In this lab, the status of Control Push Button 1, located on Universal Relay 1, will be transmitted via a remote output within a GSSE message to Universal Relay 2. UR2, upon receiving the message, will extract the appropriate remote output, store it in a remote input, and display the status of the remote output on one of UR2's user programmable LEDs. In order to complete this lab, the student requires two Universal Relays equipped with Ethernet ports, a multilink switch, a computer preloaded with the UR EnterVista setup software and the appropriate Ethernet cables. First, we need to set up and test the Ethernet LAN using the ping command as described in earlier lab exercises in the Ethernet section of this CD. Once this is done, we will configure UR1 to transmit GSSE messages. To start, let's launch the EnterVista UR setup software. From the Settings menu, select the Product Setup menu and then open the Communications menu. 
Within the Communications menu, select the IEC 61850 Configuration menu, and then the GSSE Goose Settings menu. Now set the Remote I.O. Transfer to GSSE. The default GSSE update time sets the maximum desired elapsed time between GSSE remote output multicast messages. The range of the setting is between 1 to 60 seconds. For the lab exercise, this should be set to 1 second. This setting will also be sent as part of each GSSE remote output multicast message, as it is used by receiving relays to determine if the transmitting relay is still communicating. We'll discuss this in more detail later in the lab. Each multicast message must contain a 1 to 20 character name of the sending device. To program this name, open the Setup menu and then the Installation submenu. Note that the name is case sensitive. We will use the name 1 entered in lower case. The next step is configuring UR1 such that the status of a remote output will be driven by Control Push Button 1. From the Product Setup menu, select Control Push Buttons and enable Control Push Button 1. Save, and then exit the menu. From UR1 Settings menu, select the Inputs Outputs menu, and you'll notice that there are two types of remote outputs. The first is called Remote Outputs DNA Bit Pairs, and the second is called Remote Outputs User Bit Pairs. During the early days of UCA 2.0, a distinction was made between the roles of the DNA and user remote outputs. Today, their function is the same. Bit pairs refer to the fact that the status of each remote output is stored in the form of a 2-bit pattern. To store the status of Control Push Button 1 in User Remote Output 1, first select the Remote Outputs User ST bits. Within the window beside User ST1, Select the Control Push Button 1 On operand from the list of operands and save this setting. Now each time Control Push Button 1 is pushed or released, the status of User Remote Output 1 will change state, which will result in Relay 1 transmitting an IEC 61850 multicast message containing UR1's remote output. We will now configure UR2 to receive and display the status of UR1's remote output. Start by establishing communications through the EnterVista UR setup software to UR2. Now from the Settings menu, select the Product Setup menu, and then open the Communications menu. Within the Communications menu, select the IEC 61850 Configuration menu, and then the GSSE Goose Settings menu. The Remote I.O. transfer should be set to GSSE. At this time, UR2 will only be required to receive remote output messages, and so setting the default GSSE update time isn't necessary, but we'll set it to one second anyway. Next, we need to enter a unique relay name for UR2, and so from the Settings menu, select Product Setup, and then Installation. We will use the name 2, entered in lowercase. Save all settings and exit to the main settings menu. From the settings menu, select the inputs outputs menu and then the remote device menu. Within this menu, there is room to enter up to 16 names. Here, the user can enter the names of all relays that UR2 should accept remote output multicast messages from. In the entry window beside Remote Device 1 ID, enter a lowercase 1, which is the name that was programmed into UR1, and save and close the window. Now open the Remote Inputs menu. The Remote Inputs are used to store the status of selected remote outputs contained within received multicast messages. Each of the 32 GSSE Remote Input Storage locations has an entry for a name, the bit pair default state, and events. We will enter 1 as the name of the relay the remote input is coming from. This corresponds to the name we set for UR1. The status of the control push button is located within user bit pair 1 of the multicast message transmitted by UR1, and so user ST1 will be selected for the bit pair. The remote in 1 default state setting defines the logic state if the local relay has just completed startup or the remote device sending the point is declared to be non-communicating. The following choices are available for the default state. On, off, 
latest on, and latest off. Let's take a moment to understand these default settings. The remote device, in this case UR1, is declared to be non-communicating if the local relay hasn't received a multicast message from the remote relay for a period of time equal to three times the default GSSE update time. This time is included in the last multicast message received from the remote relay. In our lab, UR1 was programmed with a default GSSE update time of one second. Therefore, if UR2 hasn't received a multicast message from UR1 for three seconds, UR2 will declare UR1 as non-communicating and will set the associated remote inputs to the programmed default state. Setting remote in one default state to on defaults the input to logic 1 if UR1 is declared to be non-communicating. A setting of off defaults the input to logic 0 if UR1 is declared non-communicating. A setting of latest on freezes the input at the last logic state if UR1 is declared non-communicating. If the latest state is not known, as would be the case after UR2 powers up but before the first communication exchange, the input will default to logic 1. A setting of latest off freezes the input at the last logic state if UR1 is declared non-communicating. If the latest state is not known, as would be the case after UR2 powers up but before the first communication exchange, the input will default to logic 0. For both the latest on and latest off settings, when communication resumes, the input becomes fully operational. We will set the default to on. Normally, the change in state of a remote input should be recorded in the event log, and so we will set events to enabled for remote input 1. Select save and exit the menu. As a final step, UR2 will be configured to display the status of remote input 1 on user programmable LED number 2. To accomplish this, from the settings menu select Product Setup, User Programmable LEDs, and again select the User Programmable LEDs submenu. For LED number 2, select the operand Remote Input 1 On and save all settings. To test the operation of our GSSE Remote I.O. configuration, Simply press user push button number 1 on UR1 and observe that the second user LED on UR2 illuminates. If UR2's Ethernet connection is removed, user LED number 2 will illuminate after 3 seconds corresponding to remote input 1's default configuration. If the connection is re-established, user LED number 2 will again display the status of control push button 1 on UR1. This communications mechanism can be very fast. When using universal relays, the total time from the remote output's change in state triggering the transmission of the multicast message to the reception and storing at the receiving relay is typically around 4 milliseconds. To prove the speed, the student could configure UR2 to retransmit the status change back to UR1 and use its oscillography to measure the round-trip time. The objective of this lab is to become familiar with the correct procedure for configuring the IEC 61850 GOOSE peer-to-peer -peer messaging service. This lab assumes the student has a good understanding of the universal relay and its menu structure, as is covered in both the UR Apps 1 Interactive Learning CD and the Universal Relay Platform course. The IEC 61850 GOOSE peer-to-peer -peer communication service is an enhanced version of IEC GSSE peer-to-peer -peer service with the additional ability of assigning priority and what is called a tag to the multicast messages. The priority can range from 0 to 7. A priority value of 1 is the lowest level of priority that can be assigned to a message. A priority value of 0 indicates that the multicast message has the default priority which is also referred to as best effort. Best effort has a higher priority than 1 and a lower priority than 2. The level of the message priority increases as the priority value is increased from 2 to 7, with 7 being the highest priority. The tag will allow the use of what are called tagged virtual LANs or VLANs. Until now, you may have considered that the logical connectivity of the LAN was equal to the physical connections. By logical connectivity, we mean two devices that can exchange data. Virtual LAN technology allows us to separate the logical connectivity from the physical connectivity. The devices are still connected via physical cables, but the connectivity is now controlled through the VLAN configuration software of the devices. The VLAN can be port-based, meaning the VLAN is determined by the physical switch port the device is connected to. 
The VLAN can also be tag-based, meaning that a tag is sent as part of the message, with the tag determining which VLAN the message will be sent to by the switch. We'll start by configuring the switch's IP address, tagged VLANs, and priority. The easiest way to configure the switch is to use a cable. It consists of three conductors terminated at either end in a 9-pin female D-type connector. Pins 5 of this cable are connected together, while pins 2 at one end are connected to pins 3 at the other end. Once you have the correct cable, the computer serial port can be connected to the serial port of the multilink switch. We will be using the Hyper Terminal application to configure the switch. This program is found in Windows under Programs, Accessories, Communications, Hyper Terminal. Once the Hyper Terminal application is launched, you'll need to cancel Hyper Terminal's dial sequence by clicking on the Cancel icon. This will allow you to access Hyper Terminal's configuration menus. Select an icon and name for the new Hyper Terminal configuration. Then, select the computer serial port that is connected to the multilink switch and click OK. Now set the baud rate to 38,400, the data bits to 8, parity to none, the stop bits to 1, and flow control to hardware. Then click OK to attempt communication to the multilink switch. At the multilink prompt to log in, press Enter. The default login name is Manager, and the default password is Manager. Once logged in, the prompt will change to the model number of the multilink switch you're connected to, indicating a successful login. The instruction manual for the multilink provides a list of all instructions. A valid IP address and subnet mask can be programmed into the switch using the IP config command as follows. We'll enter IP config space IP equals followed by the IP address. Then type space mask equals followed by the subnet mask, and then hit the Enter key. Once the switch has completed a reboot, the new IP and subnet mask will be in effect. We'll command the switch to reboot by typing Reboot, followed by the Enter key. The switch will prompt you for a confirmation to reboot, at which time you will type Y and use the Enter key to confirm the reboot. The switch will then prompt you to indicate whether or not the switch should save the new settings, which will include the new IP and subnet mask. You will again enter Y to confirm saving the new configuration. Once the switch has rebooted, you will need to log in again. To confirm that the IP address and subnet mask were saved correctly, type Show Setup followed by the Enter key. The multilink switch will then provide an on-screen list of the switch's settings, including the switch's IP address and subnet mask. Once you've verified that both are correct, we'll move on to the configuration of the VLAN and priority. The easiest way to configure the VLAN and priority is through the switch's website. First, we must ensure that the computer has a static IP address. After connecting the multilink switch onto the Ethernet LAN, ping the switch's IP address to ensure that the switch is communicating correctly on the Ethernet LAN. Next, launch your preferred web browser and enter the switch's IP address to go to the switch's web page. At the Multilink's login web page, enter the default login name, which is Manager, then enter the default login password, which is again Manager, and click on the Login button. If you have successfully logged in, you'll be presented with a graphic of the particular Multilink switch you're connected to. In order to assign a VLAN tag to a particular physical port, we need to know the number assigned to the physical port. To determine the assigned port number, proceed as follows. First, determine which physical ports are to be part of the tagged VLAN, and then note the port names which are displayed on the home screen. In our example, we want ports B3 and B5 to be part of the VLAN. Once this has been determined, open the port submenu. Using the arrow keys at the bottom of the screen, move to the screens with matching port names and record the port numbers. In our example, the port named B3 has been assigned port number 11, and the port named B5 has been assigned port number 13. Now open the VLANs menu and select the Type menu. In this menu, set the VLAN type to Tag, and then click Save. We can now proceed to the tagged based VLAN menu. From this menu, we can see that all ports have been assigned to a default tag of 1. 
To create a new tagged VLAN, select Add. From this menu, enter the new VLAN ID or tag and the name of the VLAN. We will use a tag of 2 and a VLAN name of Goose2. Left mouse click on ports 11 and 13 to add them to this new VLAN. Once complete, select Save. And then OK to exit. You'll notice that the status of the VLAN named Goose2 is displayed as Pending. Select the Status menu. To start operation of VLAN Goose2, we'll set the VLAN ID to 2, the VLAN status to Start, and select OK. You'll notice that the new VLAN is now active, but ports 11 and 13 have been removed from the default VLAN. You can add them back into the default tagged VLAN 1 so that they're part of both VLAN 1 and VLAN Goose 2. To do this, select the Configure icon for the default VLAN. Then add ports 11 and 13 to VLAN 1 by checking the corresponding boxes. Then select the Save icon at the top of the screen Then select OK to return to the main tagged VLAN menu. Note that ports 11 and 13 are now part of both VLAN 1 and VLAN Goose 2. Now that the switch has been configured, we'll turn our attention to the universal relays. We will first configure UR1 so that when control push button number 1 is pressed, the status of user remote output 1 will change to a logic 1 state resulting in UR1 transmitting a multicast IEC 61850 Goose message. Let's verify the connection of the relays to the multilink ports configured for tagged VLAN Goose 2. Now launch the Enervista UR setup software and connect to UR1. From the product setup menu, select the IEC 61850 menu and then the GSSE Goose submenu. Set the remote I.O. transfer to Goose the default update time to 1 second, and the Goose VLAN priority to the default of 4. The Goose VLAN ID must match the setting of the multilink switch, and so it will be set to 2. The Goose Transmit E-Type App ID setting allows the selection of a specific application ID for each Goose sending device. This value can be left at the default of 0. The name of the relay transmitting the Goose message is configured within the installation menu. Open the installation menu and enter 1 for the relay name. Save all settings. In order to have UR1 transmit a goose message containing the state of control push button 1, we'll again assign a remote output status to be driven by this push button. From the settings menu, select Input Outputs and then Remote Outputs User ST Bit Pairs. Within this menu, set the operand for User ST1 to Control push button 1 on. The next step isn't necessary for UR1 to transmit a goose message. But if UR1 is to receive goose messages from UR2, then UR2 must be defined as a remote device within UR1. In order to do this, open the Input Output menu and select the Remote Devices submenu. In the window beside Remote Device 1 ID, Enter UR2's name, which will be lowercase 2. We'll set the remote device VLAN ID to 2, which will match UR1 and the multilink switch. The remote device E-type application ID will be left at the default of 0. Once all settings have been saved, we are finished with UR1's configuration. The next step is to configure UR2 to accept Goose messages from UR1. First, make sure you're connected to UR2 and then from the Product Setup menu, select the IEC 61850 menu and the GSSE Goose submenu. Set the remote I.O. transfer to Goose. The default update time to 1 second and the Goose VLAN priority to the default of 4. The Goose VLAN ID must match the setting of the multilink switch and so it will be set to 2. The Goose Transmit E-Type App ID setting is once again left at the default of zero. Even though this lab does not require UR2 to transmit a Goose message, we'll configure UR2's name, which will be transmitted with all of its IEC 61850 Goose messages. From the Product Setup menu, open the Installation submenu, and in the window beside the label Relay Name, enter the name 2 in lower case, and save all settings. 
Now open the Inputs Outputs menu and select the Remote Device submenu. We must define UR1 as one of the 16 relays that UR2 will accept Goose messages from. Enter the name 1 in lower case as the Remote Device ID, 2 for the VLAN ID, and again leave the E-Type App ID at the default of 0 and save the settings. The next step is to configure UR2 to extract the status of user ST bit 1 from the multicast message transmitted from UR1 and store this status in a remote input. In this lab, we'll use Remote Input 1. Open the Remote Input submenu. In the window beside Device, enter 1, corresponding to UR1's name that is transmitted with its multicast message. In the window beside the bit pair label, Select the bit pair that contains the status of UR1's control push button, which is user ST1, and set the default state to off. The Goose default state selections are the same and work in the same manner as those of the GSSE peer-to-peer -peer service. We will set events to enabled for remote input 1 so that the change in state of a remote input will be recorded in the event log. Save the settings and exit. As a final step, UR2 will be configured to display the status of remote input 1 on user programmable LED number 2. To accomplish this, from the Settings menu, select Product Setup, User Programmable LEDs, and then select the User Programmable LEDs submenu. For LED number 2, select the operand Remote Input 1 On and save all settings. Once all settings have been saved, we're ready to test the Goose message configuration. When Control Push Button 1 on UR1 is pressed, LED 2 on UR2 should illuminate. If UR1 is powered down or its Ethernet cable is removed, an error will be displayed on UR2 after 3 seconds, corresponding to a time period equal to 3 times the default update time of 1 second configured within UR1. This completes the lab exercise. IEC 61850 has defined the information models and exchange methods for power system components such as protective relays. Within IEC 61850, the supported data exchange methods include standard read and write requests in addition to buffered and unbuffered reports. With read and write requests, the client requests to read or write an area of the server's memory and the server responds. At first, this method may seem as if it has no advantage over other protocols. However, within IEC 61850, a standardized naming convention allows the client to read or write server memory without device-specific memory mapping. This vastly reduces the integration process. Additionally, this protocol standardizes the data structures, formats, time stamping, and data qualities. The second data exchange method is known as reporting. Reporting is ideal for sampled value distribution, historical data, sequence of event logs, and control devices. The pre-configured data contained within a report could include both analog and digital point information. Reports are generated by the server and could include the entire data set, which is known as an integrity report, or could include only the data that has changed since the last report. Once a report is configured, the server will send it when a pre-configured event or trigger is met. These events or triggers include an analog input level exceeding a pre-configured deadband, the change in state of a digital point, and the change in quality of the data. Quality provides additional information about the data, such as whether or not the instantaneous value being reported is an actual measured value, a value reported during the server's power-up, a forced value, etc. The client must be able to configure within the server what data set is to be included in the report and the report criteria. The only exception is if the server, such as a universal relay, has a pre-configured data set. The report criteria is stored within an area of the server's non-volatile memory known as the report control block. 
The Universal Relay's pre-configured dataset includes MMXU1, MMXU2, and GGI01. We'll discuss these areas of memory in detail later in this section of the course. The actual data monitoring process model is defined in detail within Section 7.2, while the data values, attributes, and internal events are defined in Section 7.3 and 7.4 of the specification. Let's summarize the main points. The data set is grouped and formatted as either logged or report data. Some examples of the information that can be included within the data set are instantaneous measured values, the quality of the instantaneous value reported, the dead band value, and a timestamp of when the data changed. The report process starts when the client writes the enable. Once enabled, the actual values are evaluated to determine if an event such as a change in state has occurred. Any values within a data set that have passed the event criteria form a report. The report that is sent to the client will include the trigger or event which caused each data value to be included in the report. Buffered report information is stored within the server along with an entry ID. Reports are sent based on the report control block's configuration. If communication is lost for a brief time, the data is stored in a buffer within the server until communication is reestablished. Once reestablished, the client will resync by requesting the server resend the last successfully received report identified by the report entry ID. Once this report has been successfully received, all new buffered reports are then transmitted in sequence to the client. If the communication is lost for an extended period of time, the buffer is first filled and then the oldest reports starting with the last one that was sent successfully is removed to allow room for the latest report. This will continue in a first-in, first-out sequence until communication is reestablished. Once reestablished, the client will resync by again requesting the server resend the last successfully received report using the report entry ID as reference. Since this report no longer exists, the server will send the first report entry ID available in the queue in addition to setting the overflow flag bit within the response. Upon receiving this response, the client can choose to send a command to purge the server's report buffer, or the client can request the first available report via the entry ID sent in the server's response. As the name implies, unbuffered report information isn't stored. Once enabled, reports are sent based on the report control block's configuration. If communication is lost, the report enable is no longer true, and so the server will no longer generate reports. Once communication is reestablished, the report enable bit is set true, and so the server's report generation starts again. An integrity report is a report containing the current values of the entire dataset. The server can be triggered to send an integrity report under two conditions. The first condition requires the configuration of the integrity period within the server. Once configured for a specific time interval, the server will automatically send an integrity report at this time interval. The second condition is through the use of a flag within the server known as the GI flag. The client or server can write to this flag to cause the server to generate an integrity report. The buffer time setting is used within the server to ensure that a minimum time elapses before the server generates another report. This is used to reduce the number of reports per unit time within applications where there exists the possibility of many events or triggers occurring within a short period of time. It should be noted that if two triggers occur on the same data within the buffered report time, two reports would be generated regardless of the buffer time setting. Now that we understand the data exchange mechanisms, let's take a look at the structure and organization of data within an IEC 61850 compliant device such as the Universal Relay. An IEC 61850 physical device such as a protective relay is organized into one or more logical devices. These logical devices are composed of one or more logical nodes. A logical node is a named grouping of data and associated services that is related to a power system function. Protection elements, breakers, and current transformers are three examples of logical nodes. Measured quantities, configuration data, and timestamps are examples of the different types of data that may be contained within a given logical node. The IEC 61850 protocol uses functional constraints and common data classes to specify, define, organize, and structure the data within these differing types of nodes. 
Unit or Bay level logical nodes begin with C, P, R, A, or M. Process and equipment level logical nodes begin with S, X, T, Y, or Z. And generic use logical nodes begin with G. According to IEC 61850 Part 74, each logical node can have an optional three character application specific prefix followed by the logical node name, which is followed by a number indicating the number of instances of this logical node. The prefix plus instance digits can be no more than seven in total. This next series of lab exercises assumes the student has taken the UR platform course or is familiar with the procedures to configure a UR using the EnerVista UR setup software. Before proceeding further, it is necessary to enable server scanning within our Universal Relay. Using the EnerVista UR setup software, open Settings, Product Setup, IEC 61850 Server Configuration, and set Server Scanning to Enabled. Save this setting and then close the EnerVista UR setup software. We'll use the IEC 61850 version of the EnerVista Viewpoint Monitoring software to browse an IEC 61850 compliant Universal Relay to further examine the organization and structure of the data. The IEC 61850 station bus specifies an Ethernet physical layer. So we'll need to set up and test an Ethernet LAN between the computer and an IEC 61850 compliant Universal Relay using the procedures covered earlier in the course. To configure the Universal Relay within the EnerVista Viewpoint Monitoring software, we'll start by selecting the Device Setup tab. Next, select the Add Device push button and then enter the IP address of the Universal Relay within the IP address window. Now click on the window beside the device type label and select the Universal Relay as the device type. Finally, select the Read Order Code push button. Once the order code appears, select OK to return to the main menu. You have now completed configuring the relay. Now let's take a look at the structure of an IEC 61850 compliant Universal Relay's memory. From the main menu, select the One Line Editor. Now select the parameter icon and position the icon on the one-line screen. Right mouse click on the icon and select Properties. Now choose the correct device and select the parameter box to browse the relay's memory as you would the file system of a computer. The logical nodes contained within the relay will be displayed. Opening one of the nodes will allow us to explore the structure of the data within that node further. If we open the protective element phase time over current one logical node, we can see that data has been grouped or classified into three categories based upon the type of data, status, ST, configuration, CF, and description, DC. IEC 61850 calls these functional groupings functional constraints. The actual data is referred to as a data attribute. A functional constraint, or FC, is a property of a data attribute that characterizes the specific use of the data attribute and allows us to organize the data attributes into what are called data objects to provide structure and context. Here's a list of functional constraints that can be used to organize the relay's data attributes. There are many types of data objects. Some of the more common types of data objects are status, mode, health, configuration, description, string, and operate. Depending on the type of functional constraint and data object, IEC 61850 uses what is referred to as common data class to define the mandatory and optional data attributes that exist. A common data class takes on the form of a table or template. An example of a common data class, or CDC, is shown here. As you can see, the type of the common data class appears at the top. The data attributes are listed in the first column. The format of the data attribute is shown in the second column. The type of functional constraint is shown in the third. The trigger options are listed in the fourth. The range of the data within the data attribute in the fifth and the sixth column indicate whether or not the data attribute is optional, mandatory, or conditionally mandatory, and the condition under which it is mandatory. The meaning of several terms that appear within the table are shown here. 
Common data classes are described in detail in Part 7.3 of the IEC 61850 standard. Different types of data require different common data class templates. For example, data attributes required for configuration information will differ from those used for status or control. To better understand how this all works, let's take a closer look at the data attributes associated with the protective logical node phase time over current 1. We'll start with the status of this node. The status can be found under the functional constraint ST for status, object mode, data attribute, and status value. We note that this value is an integer, and so we must refer to the CDC template integer status. Looking at the sixth column of the CDC template for integer status, we can see that the status value, quality, and timestamp are mandatory data attributes. We can also see under what conditions it is mandatory that additional data attributes be present. To observe the operation of the data attribute status value, we'll display its value on an EnterVista one-line viewer screen. From the one-line editor, select the parameter icon and position the icon on the one-line screen. Right mouse click on the icon and select Properties. Then select the correct device and then the parameter box to browse the relay's memory as you would the file system of a computer. The logical nodes contained within the relay will be displayed. Open the Phase Time Over Current 1 logical node and then the functional constraint status to display the data object mode. Opening the data object mode will allow the data attribute status value to be selected. Click on the data attribute to highlight and select OK and OK again to exit the parameter configuration. To save the screen, launch the one-line viewer and click on the icon. Within the one-line viewer, we note that the value 5 is displayed, corresponding to the disabled mode. Using the EnterVista UR setup software, verify that the protection element phase time over current 1 is disabled. Using the EnterVista UR setup software, enable the protective element phase time over current 1 and note that the data attribute will change to a value of 1, which corresponds to logical node time over current 1's mode having changed to enabled. The data attribute labeled T data should now contain the time at which the status value changed. This time is referred to as a timestamp. IEC 61850 specifies the timestamp type to be what is referred to as Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC. The timestamp trigger is specified within the CDC. Once enabled, the default timestamp will be equal to the default reference time minus the time zone the equipment is configured to be within. Once the first valid trigger condition occurs, the timestamp will update. There are several timestamp trigger options specified within IEC 61850. The Universal Relay supports Trigger on Change, Trigger for Integrity Reports, and Trigger for a General Interrogation. Due to the high speed at which data is updated within the UR, the Data Update Trigger option is not available. The timestamp quality will indicate the accuracy in addition to clock failures. To observe the operation of the timestamp for the Data Object Mode, will display its value on an EnterVista one-line viewer screen using the following procedure. From the one-line editor, select the parameter icon and position the icon on the one-line screen. Right mouse click on the icon to gain access to open the selections menu and then select Properties. Select the correct device and then select the parameter box. Open the Phase Time Over Current 1 logical node and then the Functional Constraint status to display the data object mode. Open the data object mode and click on the label T data. This is the timestamp. Select OK and then OK again to exit the properties menu. Save the screen and launch the one line viewer for this screen and note that the timestamp updates each time the mode status changes, corresponding to the trigger specified within the integer status CDC. The operate bit of the phase time over current logical node will conform to the CDC activation shown here. To examine its operation, we'll configure the UR and element as follows. First, set the CT primary to 1000 amps and the pickup for time over current 1 to 1 per unit, or 1000 amps. Injecting 1 amp of current into any one of the UR relay secondaries corresponds to a primary current of 1000 amps, or IPU, which is equal to the pickup setting. 
injecting current at or above the pickup will cause the element to eventually operate. Using the same procedure as outlined earlier, we monitor both the status of the operate bit and the timestamp, and note that once the bit changes from a logic 0 to logic 1, the timestamp updates. The CDC also specifies a quality attribute. The quality attribute provides information about the quality of the data the server is providing. Within IEC 61850, quality codes have been standardized. At present, the quality of the data falls into one of three categories depending on the detail provided – good, invalid, or questionable. The MMXU logical nodes within the Universal Relay contain metering and measurement quantities. The instance number indicates which sources the particular MMXU logical node is assigned to. For example, MMXU1 would be for source 1 and MMXU2 would be for source 2. Reviewing the CDC for measured values, we can see that there is both an instantaneous and dead-banded current value. This diagram will help us understand the difference between the two. The instantaneous current analog value is the value at the time of the read whereas the dead-banded current value magnitude is a value that was updated at the time the analog value exceeded the dead-band value. The timestamp is also updated at the time the analog value exceeded the dead-band value. Now let's monitor the current in phase A of source 1 through EnterVista Viewpoint Monitoring's parameter function. After positioning and opening the icon, select the correct device. Now open the logical node labeled MMXU1 for source 1 and then the MeasureAnds functional constraint labeled MX. Once open, select the current data object labeled A. Expanding the data object Phase A current, we see both the instantaneous and dead-banded value subdirectories. Expanding the instantaneous current value subdirectory, we then highlight the instantaneous current value. To ensure that the time stamping occurs correctly, set the server scanning to Enabled and set up the dead bands correctly. According to IEC 618573, the dead band value shall represent the percentage of difference between the maximum and minimum in units of 0.001%. Thus, it's important to know the maximum value for each MMXU measured quantity, since this represents the 100% value for the dead band. The minimum value for all universal relay quantities is zero while the maximum values are calculated as shown. From the one-shot or viewer screen, we observe that the instantaneous current value continuously changes corresponding to the changes in the level of the injected current. Also note that the timestamp updates at the time that the injected current exceeds the upper or lower dead bands. GE Multilin recognizes that the most common way customers will produce reports is through the use of an HMI or SCADA software package and so we'll demonstrate the creation of trend reports using EnterVista Viewpoint Monitoring. From the main menu, select Trending Reports. Once you're in the Trending Reports configuration menu, click on the Add button to add a new report. Within the Report Properties, select the General tab and then enter the report's name, comment, and path for the report storage. Once you're done, select the Parameters tab. Within the Parameters tab, select Add, and then enter the relay name and select the parameter to trend, in this case, phase A's current. Click on OK and select the Chart tab. Within the Chart menu, select Add and enter a chart name and comment. In the Show column, select the corresponding name for the parameter entered for phase A's current. Clicking on the box under Color can change the default trend color. Select OK and then OK a second time to exit the chart and report configuration. The software will prompt you to start the report by clicking the Yes button. After selecting Yes to start the report, wait for the status check mark. The color indicates the status of the communication. Green indicates communication to all devices is OK, while yellow indicates not all devices are communicating. A red check mark would indicate there is no communication to any of the devices. Once the green check mark appears, select the chart option. Now select the chart corresponding to the name you'd entered. The first trend point will appear after about a minute, and a new point will appear each consecutive minute. The software samples each point every 10 seconds for a minute and plots the average. 
This completes the report lab exercise. GGIO1 and GGIO2 are two generic process I.O. logical nodes located within the universal relay that allow the exchange of digital input and output points with an HMI or SCADA application. The user can configure up to 128 digital status points into GGIO1. GGIO2 supports 128 digital input points that have been pre-configured to map to virtual inputs 1 to 128. When the HMI or SCADA application writes to a point or group of points within GGIO2, the information is then written to corresponding virtual inputs within the relay. There are differences in the implementation of the generic process I.O. between versions of the Universal Relay firmware. Beginning with version 4.8, the user must specify how many GGIO1 points will be used within the server configuration. Then the user must map the operands into the flex state table as opposed to a separate GGIO1 table. Note that version 4.8 does not support the storage of goose messages from other manufacturers. Version 5 has a dedicated GGIO1 table where the user can specify the number of points and map the operands directly into the GGIO1 point list. Also, versions 5.0 and higher support the storage of received goose messages from other manufacturers within GGIO3. Each GGIO1 bit within the UR is defined as a single point status bit within IEC 61850. The CDC for single point status is shown here. Note that the single point status, quality, and timestamp on change are mandatory. Let's take a look at the operation of GGIO1. The default number of GGIO1 bits is 8 for versions 4 and 5. This is more than enough for this exercise, so we will not change the configuration. We'll start by mapping contact virtual output 63 into GGOI 1.3. Now, within the Universal Relay's flex logic, create a 5-second oscillator as shown and save. From InterVista viewpoint monitoring, select the icon for indicator switch 1. Place it on the screen and then right mouse click on it to bring up the properties menu. Select automatic update, the on and off colors, and enter the device name. Click on the parameter button and open the GGIO1 logical node and then the status functional constraint. Within the status functional constraint, open the data object indicator 3 and highlight the data attribute STVAL, Boolean, to assign the switch to be driven by GGIO1 indication point 63. Select OK and then OK again to close the configuration windows. Once the screen is saved, Launch the viewer and note that the switch indication will change state and color corresponding to the state change of GGIO 1.63. Any additional digital point of interest within the universal relay can be mapped into GGIO 1 in a similar fashion such that its state can be read by an HMI or SCADA software package supporting the IEC 61850 protocol. To monitor the timestamp for the status change of GGIO 1.3, Select the parameter icon, position it on the screen, and then right mouse click to gain access to the properties. Select the device and then click on Parameter. Open the GGIO1 logical node and then open the status functional constraint. Within the status functional constraint, open the data object indicator 3 and highlight the timestamp data attribute. Select OK and then OK again to close the configuration windows. Once the screen is saved, launch the viewer and note that the timestamp will update each time the point changes state. GGIO2 allows an external IEC 61850 compliant device, such as an HMI or SCADA application, to control the status of digital points within the universal relay. These points are called controllable single points within the specification. If we look at the controllable single point CDC, we can see that control, status points, and timestamps are mandatory. We'll now demonstrate the steps required to send a command to set and reset a virtual input within the universal relay. To allow three virtual points within the UR to be controlled, enable virtual inputs 1, 2, and 3 using the EnerVista UR setup software. Within EnerVista Viewpoint's one-line editor, select the Send Command to Virtual Input icon, and then select a location and size on the screen. Click to paste the icon on the screen. 
To drive the status indication portion of this icon, first, right mouse click on the icon, select Properties, open the Attach tab, and then open the GGIO2 logical node, and then the status functional constraint. Now open the data object single point control and status for point 1. Attach the indication to data attribute status value 1, and then select OK. To enable set and reset commands to this same icon, go to the Controls tab. For the set, or on command, first enter the name on in the first command name window. Ensure that the value to send has been set to 1, and then select the Parameters button. Open the GGIO2 logical node, and under the Control Functional Constraint, open the Data Object Single Point Status, and then the Operate Data Object. Highlight the Attribute Control Value 1, and select OK. For the Reset or Off command, first enter the name Off in the second command name window. Ensure that the value to send has been set to 0, and then select the Parameters button. Open the GGIO2 logical node. Under the Control Functional Constraint, open the Data Object Single Point Status, and then the Operate Data Object. Highlight the Attribute Control Value 1. Select OK, and then OK again to close the Properties menu. Once the screen is saved, launch the viewer. Click on the control icon and a window will open which will allow you to turn the single point on or off. To turn the single point on, simultaneously click the button while pressing the control key. You'll see a visual confirmation of the command via a pop-up message and the change in color of the status indicator. To observe the operation of the control timestamp, select the parameter icon and then position the icon on the screen. Right mouse click to gain access to the properties menu and then select the correct device. Select the parameter and open the GGIO2 logical node, then open the control functional constraint. Within the data object single point control and status, open the operate data object and then highlight the data attribute T date. Select OK and then OK again to close the configuration windows. Once the screen is saved, Launch the viewer and note that the timestamp will update each time the point changes state. Nameplate CDCs provide additional information about the device and logical nodes. These nameplates can be displayed using the same procedure as was used to display timestamps. This completes this section of the course. Those that configure a large number of IEDs from different manufacturers within a substation are looking for a universal configuration tool to simplify the configuration process. If all substation equipment conforms to the IEC 61850 standard, this is now possible due to standardized objects, semantics, and units. An additional benefit of this universal programming language, which would be of tremendous benefit to the user, is that it allows superior products to replace other products with a minimal amount of reconfiguration. Within IEC 61850, this language is called the Substation Configuration Language, or SCL for short. The language is based on an XML file format, which allows a formal description of the substation automation system, the switchyard, and the relationship between them and the IED configuration files, in addition to the schema of the switchyard equipment, which is in a UML file format. The SCL tool accepts the ICD files from the different IEDs in addition to the single line diagram SSD file. The tool is a high level configurator, allowing the user the ability to configure system wide functions such as inter IED communications within the tool. The SCL software saves this system configuration information in a single SCD file. The IED configuration software is then able to extract the configuration information for a specific IED from the SCD file and load it either directly into the IED or save it in what is referred to as a CID file. This can then be loaded at a later date to the IED. An IEC 61850 course wouldn't be complete without taking a few moments to at least touch on process bus. The process bus is intended to replace the traditional hard wiring between CTs and PTs and the protective relay over which the measured quantities from CTs and or PTs would be continuously transmitted. 
Upstream protective relays and other devices interested in these measured quantities for protection, metering, and monitoring will listen to the process bus for the information of interest. There are two types of process bus specified in Part 9 of the IEC 61850 specification. Part 9.1 specifies what is termed as a serial, unidirectional, multi-drop, point-to-point link. Part 9.2 specifies Ethernet, or IEEE 802.3, and suggests several alternatives for the process bus architecture. Let's take a few moments to look at them. The first alternative is a communication bus structure where each bay has its own process bus segment. To allow for protection and control equipment that requires data from more than one segment, a separate, station-wide communication bus is installed with switches or routers to each bay segment for transmitting the required data streams. The second alternative is a similar structure, but each bay segment covers more than one bay. With this alternative, switches or routers transfer any data streams that are required by more than one segment. The example shows data from the bus bar voltage transformer being used by directional earth fault relays on all bays. The third alternative indicates a single station-wide communications bus to which all devices are connected. This requires a very high data rate on the bus, but eliminates the need for routers. The last alternative is a function-oriented bus structure. In this case, the bus segments are set up to correspond to protection zones. Although routers are required, the segments can be arranged to minimize the data to be transferred between segments. Users are free to use any one of the suggested process bus architectures. The signals from conventional CTs, PTs, digital I.O., and slow-speed analog, or non-sinusoidal signals, can be connected to the process bus by what the IEC 61850 specification refers to as a merging unit. This unit addresses system voltage, current magnitude measurement, time synchronization, input-output processing, and communications. The merging unit primarily monitors and converts AC current and voltage signals to a digital count with a timestamp and publishes this information on the process bus in addition to digital I.O. and slow-speed analog information. To better understand the basics of the process bus, let's look at an example of how the merging unit would typically process an analog signal from a conventional current transformer. This is just an example for instructional purposes. The CT's output would first pass through an analog filter before being sent to a sample and hold circuit. As the name implies, this circuit will hold the analog signal at a constant level. There are eight sampling rates specified within the standard for the process bus, ranging from 10 to 200 times the rated system frequency. The next circuit, called the analog to digital converter, converts the magnitude of the analog signal into a digital count. Once converted to a digital count, the merging unit will add a timestamp from the time reference, and then the count and timestamp become part of a data set. Once all data is ready, the merging unit broadcasts the data onto the process bus. Relays, controllers, and metering equipment connected to the process bus can then receive these transmissions simultaneously. The ultimate goal of conformance and performance testing is to verify that a device conforms to the standard, which increases the likelihood of interoperability in the field, resulting in the success of a project. IEC 61850 Part 10 deals with both conformance and performance testing. The introductory portion of Part 10 deals with definitions and acronyms, such as DUT, which is an acronym for Device Under Test, this portion also covers PIXIT, which is an acronym for Protocol Implementation Extra Information for Testing. The next section is Conformance Testing, which deals with methods and abstract test cases for conformance testing of devices. The last section is Performance Testing, which deals with methodology and the metrics to be measured within devices to be able to declare performance. It is within the scope of responsibilities of the UCA International Users Group to provide IEC 61850 with certification of test procedures and systems, educational seminars and conferences, a help desk for user assistance, input for standards work in addition to promotional activities. There are many advantages to becoming a member of the Users Group such as the ability to access all information along with the support of rigorous testing which lowers the cost of ownership. Members are able to participate in the standards process without the cost of attending IEC meetings 
and vote on key technical issues important to their organization. The certification is a statement defining who ran the tests and how the results were determined. The certification body determines a pass or fail. At present, the only existing test lab certified by the UCA International Users Group is KEMA. The result of the test can be either a pass or fail, which indicates if the device under test behaves as specified by IEC 61850 and picks it, or inconclusive, which means that due to ambiguities in the device's responses to test cases or ambiguities in the standard, further action is required. A resolution process is in place to solve technical issues and to provide feedback of user experience to improve the standard. Within IEC 61850, the technical issue problem resolution process is referred to as the tissue process. The tissue process begins with a UCA IUG member emailing a technical issue. The issue is reviewed and sent to the responsible member of the group of technical experts. This member creates the first proposal to address the issue and distributes it to the entire group. After discussion, a final proposal is distributed to the tissues group for a vote. If there is 100% membership approval of the proposal, a green sheet is created with the proposal and submitted to the IEC Technical Committee 57 Working Group 10. Otherwise, the proposal is submitted as a yellow sheet. Both the green and yellow sheets are available on the UCA website.